Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the last pre-performance talk of the season. Thank you. They have been fun, exactly. And many of you um, have come to all of them, and many of you have come to most of them, and that is a wonderful thing and very much appreciated by everybody at the theatre. So thank you to you before we start. Um, my name is Kate Moss. Um, I'm a novelist and a writer, and as some of you know, also the biographer, as it were, of Chichester Festival Theatre at 50 uh, last year. And it's been my great pleasure this year to be able to talk privately and intimately with the great directors and writers involved in the season, but in public, in front of you. Um, so for the last one, it is an enormous treat to have here Jeremy Heron. Uh, many of you will have seen um, other plays he's directed here, not least of all the wonderful Southdowns um, last year. Um, Jeremy, of course, has worked at the Royal Court. He's worked at the National. He is insanely busy. He's going from here up to direct Hilary Mantel at the RSC, um, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. Ooh. Yes, exactly. It is, you good. See. I'm, I'm just that's trying exciting, to sell you an audience great. up there good, as like well. The woo, uh, you like the woo. Yeah, um, it but a woo. we're here tonight to talk about the last play in the Minerva of this 2013 festival season, Another Country. Um, an extraordinary play which, when it was first written, came out in the very early 80s. Nobody would put it on, and then it was put on at the Greenwich Theatre and has become one of those absolutely iconic plays. Um, so, Jeremy, starting with the label of an iconic play, mm. is this um, a play that you have always wanted to work on, work on more than once? You know, what brings it and you to Chichester at the moment, this time? Well, we had a really good time with South Downs. Um, I don't know if there are any. Is there anybody here that's, that saw that? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, I mean, that was a, that was quite a success, and Jonathan was pleased with the way in which I directed Jonathan Church, the artistic director, was pleased the way in which I directed the, the the young actors, and I've worked a lot with young actors, and I really enjoy that. So we were looking for something else, and it transpired that he had the rights for another country, which hasn't been properly revived probably for 30 years. I think there was a, a production in the year 2000 that didn't didn't work very well. Uh, because the production wasn't um, particularly good by all accounts. So uh, <laughs> that's always good when there's a play sitting there that an artistic director that wants to employ you is sitting on the rights for and that you fancy doing. And I always had a very positive relationship with the play because um, as a public school boy myself in the early 80s, it was a sort of quite an iconic um, piece of work. Uh, and I was identified with Judd because I was a schoolboy. Uh, communist as well um, and so I, I always thought that Judd was one of my favorite characters and I really appreciated the what felt the quite sort of um, aggressively uh, hu humani hu humanist um, response of Julian Mitchell the writer to Bennett's sexuality I thought was a really good thing and in the early 80s it felt like um, quite an aggressive uh, uh, feeling in society towards um, gay people, particularly uh, gay kids who didn't quite know who they, who they were or how to express themselves. So Another Country as a play was always on um, the side of right, I always felt, and felt very sort of fond of it because it was formative and obviously it turned into a, a very successful film. And I think at the time there was a sort of an aesthetic and a sort of iconography around that. That, uh, that, that I felt I was a, of an age to, to enjoy. So I suppose it's just a trip towards those um, feelings, to, re to remember those feelings. Um, and then coming back to working on the play and reading it again and then considering it for production, I thought it was a, a brilliant opportunity to create a good bit of theatre. So I grabbed it with both hands. I mean, I, I'm, I, I suspect, a little bit older than you. Um, and I remember it um, in the early 80s. It was part of the context of sort of he, at Clause 28, there's sort of uh, that moment when various people were being unmasked. And as so far as I understand, Julian Mitchell, you know, read about Blunt, you know, being unmasked, yes. and that was out. And then he sort of almost straight away went to his desk and sat down yes. to write a play about how it happened that the men at the heart of establishment yes. were actually the ones trying to bring it down. Yes. So did you read it as a text, or did you see the film, or did you see one of the productions? How did you actually come? To the play, in uh, the very I saw first the film. I saw with the, the Rupert Everett and yeah, uh, and Colin Firth. Colin Firth film. And so I saw it as a film first, and then I would have. I think I saw a schoolboy production of it actually, um, at the school that I went to. Yeah, uh, 
it, probably in the sort of mid or late 80s, 88 or something, there was a, a production of it at school that was, I thought was great and I thought was better than the film because it has a crucial, the difference between the film and the, and the play is there's a character called Vaughan Cunningham that appears only in the play and he doesn't appear in the, uh, in the film and he brings sort of much needed weight and an adult voice and uh, it, it finds a sort of cultural, political context for a lot of themes in the play and it's, uh, it's a very entertaining and wonderful, uh, wonderful scene. So it elevates the experience. So that, that, was, a good, that was a good thing. Um, and it's, he's a glimpse of the future as well for the boys, isn't he? That it's, it's not just about being a child at school with yes, no power. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there's a kind of wonderful transaction that, that it's very difficult to do subtly. I think we've, we've got a good version of it now, but it's a, kind of da it's a very dangerous part. It's a, 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 an intellectual, a writer, a journalist, who's in his 50s, um, who's described earlier in the play, he's set up by one of the other boys, and he's described as the ripest of fruit, apparently. And they're all terrified because this pacifist is turning up who wears shock horror uh, suede shoes, which is obviously <laughs> some 1930s euphemism for his, uh, his sexuality. And so this, this guy is, is foregrounded and set up to be someone um, with dangerous opinions. And actually turns up, he's a very kind and a very decent man. And he provides, I suppose, a doorway to a more free and engaged um, artistically, uh, intellectually way of life that, that helps Bennett that helps him see that all is not lost and that he doesn't need to uh, apologize for his nature. So it's a, kind of, it's a wonderful sort of showpiece scene. Um, and I've, what, what was the question again? Kate? Well, it doesn't really matter what the question is. No, so I could just do this for hours, you know. <laughs> this is good, rambling is yeah. good. We like a ramble um, here. No, it was more that, um, for me, I felt that what was so significant about that character yeah. was that it, is an explanation that is missing from the film yeah. because if it is just the hot house yeah. of the dormitory, as it were, yeah. um, then there's no reason to think, think that actually in the real world things won't be different. Yeah. But there is this man who is still a different sort of outsider as the communist yes. and the boy who yes. is gay. Yes. And grown ups are still ostracised and outside of yeah. it. So the establishment can keep you out all the way through. Yes. That's, what, that's really what the question yeah. I was asking about, yeah. um, why I thought he mattered so much. That yeah. Well, there are two things that occurred to me with you saying that. The first, the first thing is to proper, it, I was really um, delighted with uh, Julian Wadden because it felt, he's playing Vaughan Cunningham, because it felt like he properly engaged with the bravery required to be a conscientious objector, which is a very difficult situation to, to be in, but to follow that, that idea of having the bravery uh, to follow one's moral intuitions seems to be an extremely sort of um, clear and resonant sound that the play makes and is worth engaging with. And the other thing that occurs to me to, to, to say is that when, when Julian was minded to write the play, it was as a result of the Cambridge spies, Burgess and Blunt and Philby and McLean. And he, he, was, he was frustrated because in the media, everyone was uh, analysing their ideological response to communism, to the Soviet bloc and wanted to betray. And he said, he, he felt in his, in his guts really, that there was a much stronger reason. And that was, it was an emotional reaction to the cruelty and the hypocrisy inherent in the public school system. Um, and I think that's a really terrific starting point for a play. So that's maybe say if you if you're seeing it tonight if you haven't already seen it, that's quite a good launch pad to see to, just to chart that theme throughout the evening. The idea of hypocrisy and how the fabric and the structure of those schools uh, not only tolerate it but actively encourage it is a a very interesting. Um, I think it's a very interesting question to ask, particularly when thirty years on from the first production of the play, you look at the cabinet and you see that there's a, a large amount of public school boys in pole position in our, in our society. It, it does ask the question um, about how relevant the play is today. So you can answer that yourselves, I'm sure, later on. Well, I mean, that, that must have been something that you and Jonathan and then the cast talked about. The idea that it was written at a particular time. Um, since then, 
the story of communism, the Berlin Wall yeah. coming down, all the various uh, revolutions, changes in the law as regards homosexuality, gay marriage, yeah. all of these things, um, and pacifism in terms of mass demonstrations against war yeah. and a recent vote. Mm. So what, did you, what do you feel about that sense of relevance in terms of the political context having changed quite a lot, or do you not really think it has? Well, I think, it, I think it's, it's really interesting, particularly in terms of the communism of, of Judd, because that's history. He keeps talking about, the character keeps talking about history. Um, and actually, history has decided and has rejected that as a, as a way of life. So there's a delicious dramatic irony of seeing this uh, you know, very intelligent, very bright, fully um, intended, clever, clear, articulate boy embracing an ideology um, and yet there's a dramatic irony because we can see that that's been bankrupted and uh, history hasn't had any use for that and so it's rejected it. So that's very interesting. The politics of homosexuality particularly interesting in the way that in the early 80s you, you one felt, I imagine when one saw it, that there was a, it was a clarion call really for tolerance and um, uh, freedom and actually now on a certain you know, if the wind is with us on a certain evening, it feels like an absolute celebration um, of our own natures and not being told uh, that we have to classify ourselves one way or the other. And actually it feels that as a society, certainly when we look at uh, the play and we feel the trials and tribulations of a, of a young boy of 17 being confused and disappointed <laughs> by looking at the future and seeing that all the avenues uh, that, he, that were once open to him are, are closing off because of his nature, actually, we, we might look at society, we might feel differently. We might feel that actually, collectively, we've worked a few of these problems out and for someone at that age, they won't necessarily feel so miserable or do anything as rash as, as to take their own life. Um, although, of course, the other way of looking at it is that there is still a lack of tolerance in, in certain parts of society. So it just asks a lot of those questions. You know, you can, you can flip it one way or the other that it's it's relevant because it's still, it's still an issue for good, or, for good or bad. And do you, when you were deciding how to stage it for yourself, you know this theatre yeah. well in this space and you were saying before that you love working here. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, so did you have a clear sense of what you wanted it to look like, how you were going to do it, or was that part of your discussions with the creative team? Yes, part of the discussions because, it's, you know, every, every play has got a there's a code that you need to crack and it's usually the amount of different locations that you need to go to. So um, I think it's four different locations um, in, in, this, in this place. So you keep coming back to most of them so that you can't ever get rid of anything. So there has to be an element of using the resources to return. And yet you want the design to support the general atmosphere um, of the school. And you'll see in the second half and later in the first half, there are these other environments that we just go to once that, uh, that have a certain level of complexity in order to achieve them. So it's just a bit of a jigsaw, really. Um, we decided that we should stay sort of minimally realistic with it because that would support the writing. Um, yeah, you weren't tempted to transfer it to a completely different place or well, sort of add suppose, some songs. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, we did. I mean, there is some singing in it and in the text, it's supposed to be recorded, or at least in the in the rubric in the in the in the in in, the, in Julian's um, annotated text. It suggests that the song in other country is played um, as a recording, but I thought it was a good opportunity to to hear voices because there's just something wonderful and theatrical about that anyway. So I suppose with a sort of naturalism and a realism required, we've pushed the boundaries as much as possible. And you might notice and you might enjoy that the scene changes are quite fluid and quite expressive. So we try to do something different each time just to add to the tension, add to the picture, because these are things that... Um, I, I've always been suspicious of, uh, of theatre. An old boss of mine, Stephen Daldry, used to describe it as burglary theatre, where you would, have a, you would have a scene and then everything would go dark. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would sneak around and try not to get caught, <laughs> even though there's 300 people watching them. Yes. Um, Look, I've got a chaise long. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So I've, I've always felt that that's always a good opportunity just to... I mean, the audience aren't idiots. They know what the transaction is. They might as well enjoy 
the fact that you've really organised the scene changes so that you can do it with a bit of a flourish. Because I think particularly when you're doing, when you're doing, a, when you're doing a play that seems sort of psychologically real and you're trying to represent uh, a characters that, that behave in the way that we all behave, sometimes you can't see any uh, virtuosity or skill in that if it's done rightly. You know, you just want the, the, the audience to engage with the characters. Um, and occasionally, unless you have an opportunity to, to do a bit of um, virtuosic behaviour, it's, it's useful to keep checking in with the audience to say, don't worry, we know what we're doing. Uh, there is skill involved in this and organisation involved in this. Therefore, I think on some subliminal level, you're asking the audience to take your word for the choices that you're making because you're reminding them that it's not uh, happenstance, it's not um, random, that it's precisely presented for their edification, you would hope. And also, because um, the nature of this play in particular, mm. it's, it's young boys and a system of younger boys doing things for older boys, and it's very hierarchical, it's appropriate in a funny sort of way that they're moving the furniture. Yeah. Because it is a self-contained world in that way. Yes, and also it just does get, it do, what it does add to the evening, because you know, a lot of the time it's, it's boys who are becoming men in the sort of purest sense, in that suddenly they're having to take responsibility for a series of decisions, they're having to strategize, they're having to work out who they are under these very um, tense circumstances. And what you can lose with that is some of the kind of exuberance of that um, quite free uh, youthful energy. And just sort of having a whole lot of lads charge on and chuck furniture around is a part of, of bringing that into the, into the evening. It's also one of those plays um, that is credited with, well, rightly credited with starting, you know, uh, careers of Daniel Day-Lewis, yeah. Ken Branagh, Rupert Everett, yeah. Colin Firth. Um, it's a vehicle for discovering young talent and giving it proper work. Yeah. So you have often worked with younger casts. Um, is that something that you particularly enjoy, the idea of working with actors at the beginning of their careers who are not bringing a legacy of all these different roles like shadows behind them? Yes, like. uh, yeah, it's, re it's really enjoyable because, you know, on the one hand, um, uh, you know, you, maybe they don't have so much technique or experience because they haven't been on stage, but what, what, they, what they really don't have is fear. So they'll just really, I mean, you, I'm sure you can understand um, that it can be quite frightening and a, a lot of adrenaline stepping onto a stage and working as a team in this way. I'm sure that's partly the reason why we love going to the theatre mm -hmm. is because it's quite high stakes and it's quite exposing and it's quite vulnerable making and we really appreciate the skill involved in a great, in a great performance. And so there's just something really wonderful about, um, in this instance, young men just going for it uh, and really being uncynical and being really hungry for the experience and there's something really wonderful about about that that's 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 always good and and the other thing is is that you know often i've worked with you know all ends of the spectrum into, as a director and sometimes you i've worked with um older actors you need to be very careful now <laughs> it's all right we'll take it out yeah. of the recording uh, i've worked with older actors with a profile and often they don't want to push themselves into territory that they have never been before because they feel well that they have some spurious sense of a public and that their public won't respect them for that. And actually the, the text or the play will need a particular thing, or at least there's a, an imaginative opportunity to head towards something that you haven't done before. Um, and not all older actors are like that, but most younger actors aren't like that at all. And I suppose that's quite thrilling. Um, so you don't have to negotiate any of that nonsense, which is great. I also love being in the position where I can follow my own instinct and my own judgment about whether people are good or not. I love giving people first jobs because it just feels like quite an exciting mm. thing and I've been lucky enough to work with some really nice um, actors very early in their career and it just it, it's a it's a good thing to back your own instinct and it's it's a it's a pleasing thing so we'll have to see which of the ones you uh, spot yes and you'll be able ears. to say you saw them here first yes, and that exactly. will also be, be rather great. wonderful because yeah. there are so many people who will come up you know particularly when we were doing the 50th anniversary last year and said well i remember that derek jacoby when he was second murderer in macbeth in that you know this sort of and yeah. th there is something rather wonderful about seeing an actor at the beginning of his or her career yes yeah i think so and you know you would hope that you'd see them down the years coming back to this theater the new theater when it's built and i'm um, keeping in touch with how they're, how they're developing 
Now, when I did the um, a pre-performance interview last week with Angus Jackson, oh, yeah. um, who I've, is I've directing... I've heard of him, I think. Yeah. Have you heard of him? He's <laughs> quite so. a young director yeah. also. You He's know. up and coming, yeah. <laughs> He's the elbows for the pair of you. Yeah. Um, we, he, he also did it with Tim Firth, who is the writer of Neville's Island. How closely have you been working with Julian Mitchell on, on this particular production? Or? Well, he came in to do all the casting, so he was there, and I started to get to know him. Um, our first evening was a really lovely uh, moment where he drove me in his Mercedes up from Never wherever bad. it is, <laughs> yeah, up from West London, his house in West London, to a college in Oxford where we saw a student production of Another Country. Um, huh. which was really interesting to see um, lots of pitfalls that you could make with a play. <laughs> it was a very instructive evening. Such this, as? Uh, well, well, such as a kind of the way in which we deal with uh, received ideas of how a homosexual behaves, which uh, <laughs> there is no particular way that a homosexual behaves. And I think the danger with... Uh, with any of that stuff is that you make Are we caricatures around or, camping it up? Yeah, yeah. which, which can, completely ruined the play and stopped the heart of the play from working because there was a very sort of shallow veneer of characterisation rather than something you I'm not saying that we've necessarily achieved it, but we've certainly aspired towards it, which is to go deep into the character, understand the social, political context, the historical context, imagine who that person is right from the very inside and their sexuality, their choice. What was really fantastic, actually, I'm just going to break my form just to uh, make an observation. One of the really surprising and brilliant things about the whole process was that um, never at any point of five weeks rehearsal um, did any of the young actors feel the need uh, to be very clear or to assert their own sexuality in opposition to the sexuality of the characters that they were playing in the play, which I just thought was so fantastic um, so that we didn't even have to talk about ourselves and who we were and how that, just to make everybody, there was no, um, there was no fear, no worry, no homophobia at all, which was absolutely brilliant. And that, that I'm sure, is different. Yeah. Because when you read, you know, I would say I've been reading Richard Eyre's diaries, National Service of his time, and the importance of Ian McKellen making a public statement when he accepted an Olivier. Yeah. They, well, they weren't called that, I don't think, then. About Ian Charleston, who was dying of AIDS. Yeah. And that even then, it had to be said, because yeah. people quite... So that's a wonderful yeah. change, isn't it? It's a, ba it's a massive change, and it's a, and, it's a, and it's a brilliant thing. It's a very good thing. And um, one thing we were um, also just briefly skirting around before, that... You, here we have an all-male cast, and mm. it's an all-male boarding school, obviously. Um, it's an explanation at how the establishment works, mm. keeps its power, got its power in the first place. Um, I know, you, you know you've directed a female playwright about an all-female boarding school, yeah. so you are very even-handed in this, um, obviously. Um, do you think that with plays like this that are so significant, that there is any way to do what the RSC is doing, they're about to do an all-female Taming of the Shrew, or Maxine Peake, I don't know if you read this in the papers, has just been cast as Hamlet. Um, this sense of, you know, cross-gender yeah. uh, casting. With a play like this, does it so absolutely belong in the boys' boarding school system that it loses its snap if you change well, it? It might be worth an experiment, but that's what it, that's what it would be, and I would s probably suggest that, that Jonathan and Alan wouldn't want to take that risk. There might be other contexts in which to do that. I wonder whether, um, well, girls and boys would behave, would behave differently in, under these circumstances, I think it's fair to say, without, um, without being sexist. I think the circumstances would be, the modes of behaviour would be different. So it'd be an interesting experiment, but probably not such a not such a good one for an audience, because I think the where 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 there's great value in that is taking a text that everybody has a, a relationship with on some level, um, so that so that you can you can kind of enjoy the gender shift uh, in in the way that it's intended. I think all that would happen with another country is that you would you would find it difficult to make it work, yeah, I think. It wouldn't make sense. I don't think it would. Yeah. And I think, I mean, these questions are really, really important. I think it's really important for, for theatres to, um, to be very clear that there's a, sort of gen there's a gender balance in its, ma in its material. Um, but sadly, it plays about power, plays about stupid blokes being stuck on an island. <laughs> you know? Um, 
<laughs> if, you, if, you're do, if you're doing those accurately, you know, the, the comic, I'm sure that the comic mechanism of Neville's Island wouldn't, you know, the women would just work it out, wouldn't they? <laughs> um, so, you yes. know, you could, you could argue in another country, they might just all sit down and have a proper talk about it. <laughs> and put their arms around each other and say, yeah. are you feeling all right? Yeah. It'd be entirely different. There'd be no it, play, it, would it there? It could be. Although the, the play that I did do, which is a play called Kin by a writer called Emma, Emma Crow, um, was about cruelty and bullying in the girls' school system. So I think it just expresses itself in subtly different ways at those, uh, at those ages. Um, and that was a play about homophobia within, within that sort of circumstance as well. But it doesn't actually link to power, really. I mean, it's, it, the, you know, that, that sort of debate is about a closed society, really, isn't it? Rather than the power that, that is, is there for the taking. Yes. I suppose that's how another country resonates, isn't it? Is that you see that the men that are in power that are running these uh, institutions and the government and making these, um, for, you know, life-changing uh, decisions for us all have been brought up in this place. So, so that even though that it's, it's a microcosm, it does resonate beyond that down the ages. And I think that's, that's possibly, um, I think that's, it, that's an interesting way to ask a whole lot of questions. Um, whilst resolutely not endorsing that system, I, th I think fundamentally the play isn't sexist in itself. I think fundamentally it's no, all no, no, about absolutely. equality and about um, freedom. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a bitter truth that in order to write a play about that, you give wages to a group of people that aren't, it, there is an agenda balance there. Mm. And I suppose over the course of a few seasons, I'm sure the the Chicha Festival Theatre would have a look at their books and have a, you know, have a have a response really to, to that sort of balance, or at least, I'm sure they should do. You know. There is when I when I was watching it, I felt there was um, a real wonderful sense of joy in a funny sort of way, uh, um, despite the the, the, the tragic uh, subject matter for for certain of the characters. Um, about it being a very obvious ensemble piece, despite the fact that there are very clearly delineated characters. And I wondered, now you see it, um, is it the play that you thought it was going to be, that day one in rehearsal when you started it off? Are there things that have surprised you that have come out, things that have given you particular pleasure that you weren't expecting? Well, it, it's, um, these seagulls are good. I hope you're enjoying these. <laughs> It's a they? tape, you yeah, know. exactly. <laughs> it's just to make us feel like we're close to the seaside. Um, uh, yes, I mean the play is really. It's what's great is is as you say the joy that's in it. You think my memory of it was that it was a, a kind of emotionally wrought piece about these issues, but actually in reality it's a it's a comedy. There's lots of cracking jokes in it, and there's a sense of a, you know a very generous transaction from the stage to the audience. It's really for the audience, and in in that sense it's sort of boulevard piece with a progressive theme, I would say. There's something traditional about the, the playmaking. There's something traditional about um, its desire to entertain and delight its audience. So whether that still holds now, um, I'm not sure. But that's, the, that's, our, that's our ambition, modest as it is. Well, I, I think that has been achieved. In, who, who has already been in uh, to see the play? And who's going in tonight? Excellent. So you'll, you'll have them all one way or another, yes, Jeremy, you know, right, either, either before or after, as it were. Um, the, the last question I want to ask you before I, I give the audience just a, a, a chance to ask a couple of questions is um, when you are you're doing something that's this is beautiful. You know, it's an exquisite play to look at. Um, there is a great sort of elegance about how you've directed it, I felt, and it, it looks very Thank beautiful. You. And then you're going up to do um, you know, you've taken over Headlong, which many of you will know. Um, Rupert Gould, obviously, was very much the person associated with that. Been at the Royal Court. Now you're going to the RSC to do a huge mm. piece of history of, um, you, know, you know, with, obviously, Hilly Ram the, uh, the adaptation of Hilary Mantel's books. Yeah. Is this a change is as good as a rest? Is it exciting to go from the smaller space to the bigger space? Well, it's the, quite a small space, actually. It's the Swan. Oh, you're so in the it's Swan. Not, yeah, so it's, yeah. Not the, it's not the big one, but um, I enjoy working in big spaces. I think what's really wonderful about uh, you know, life in the theatre and, and my career, as it's turned out, is that I do manage to do lots of different things. I'm not one of those directors um, that sort of applies the same approach 
to each of the projects that he or she does and actually decides projects on the strength of you know whether they fit into that narrative or a sense of that uh, narrative I've got a much looser more associative sense of the work that I want to do and I like to just keep it um, ticking over and I like to do things that are going to be challenging and different and you know you can only you know the, there's only 12 months in a year there's only a certain amount that you can do I suppose if anything I'm guilty of just being greedy and trying to do um, too much but I, I suppose I feel so lucky that people ask me to do um, direct plays that it feels a bit churlish not to to say to yes. Do if I can. <laughs> but I'm going to have to calm down a little bit because I've got different responsibilities with, um, with Headlong as an uh, as a artistic director. So um, some more time in the office and allowing other people to direct is going to be a sort of slight change for me after I do that. Was that, was that quite a big decision, whether you wanted to take on the, you know, the AD over the top type role, the administration, all the things that go with well, it? I think it was a massive decision for the, the, for the board that selected me. Um, of course, it just, it just seemed like a, I didn't have to think, so I had to discuss it with my, um, my partner and my kids, but it was something that absolutely I wanted to do. I didn't, I didn't worry about it at all. Um, a job like that, I think you're really, really, you're, you're lucky and you fought through a, um, a very impressive field to get a job like that. So I do feel really blessed that, um, that it's up to me now, what the direction that that company takes. It's a fantastic opportunity. I mean, you'll have seen some of the productions here. I think a lot of them started here over the well, last Well, Enron few years. was the one that Enron, started here. Yeah. Uh, six characters. Six characters yeah, that was, was here, here as well. absolutely. So I'm hoping that, um, that maybe if, if I don't come back as a, as a freelance director, that Headlong will come back here. And we're already, Jonathan and I are already talking about some exciting projects. So it'd be just really wonderful to to have a yearly visit, because I've had one for the last three years. Well, that's so. brilliant. It's now on tape, or whatever we do with these days. So I think you're fine. I think yeah, the, the last show in the Minerva every year. Yeah. What about that? The, the crucial thing is getting Jonathan to agree to it. Uh, well, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, you will all, I'm sure, be able to persuade Jonathan, and you will need no persuading. Um, we have time for a few questions from the audience. If you could have the lights up a bit. Um, or, yes, we can have the lights. Has anybody got a question they'd like to ask? Where is Greg Slay? He's normally here first. Yeah, have you got no question, Greg? There's a, right, there's that's a terrible. Moment. Lady in the front, then. <laughs> yeah, I wondered how much your experience at a public school coloured your production and how you felt you wanted to do it. Yes. Did you suffer, not suffer? Uh, I th I, there was a bit of suffering. I mean, it's, you know, suffering in a particular context, isn't it? But actually, the, the difference between public schools in the 80s and the 30s is probably quite minimal. There was a little, there was a bigger shift in the 60s. But they're essentially the same sort of institutions. We all went down to Winchester to do a bit of research. That's where um, Julian Mitchell went. It's not exactly Winchester, but it must be based on Winchester. And it's also uh, Rob, who plays Guy Bennett, that he went there. So we had a good old look around Winchester, which is a sort of perverse and b bizarre place. If there are any Wickhamists in, uh, you, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Um, it's a very interesting and, and you know, very impressive in lots of ways institution, but very particular. Um, and I, w w without it informing directly uh, any choices that I consciously made, I'm sure that I hold that experience with me um, and that I can monitor what I see as accurate or inaccurate in terms of uh, when, I'm, when I'm directing it. I would just think, well, boys don't behave like that because that's not my experience. Or um, when I was at school, it was a bit like this. So there was lots of that sort of chat. Uh, and of course, you know, I bear the emotional scars to this day <laughs> i suppose maybe directing the play i can let some of that go now <laughs> so it's uh, therapy really of course it Theater is, yeah. is it's therapy. all it's all therapy fantastic <laughs> yeah thank you another question gentlemen there thank you uh, your your wish to work with new young actors each time sort of over the road going back to anyone you've worked with before like in well they should they, they, they all grow up don't they <laughs> So when you're when you're oh, yeah, almost yeah I mean you try you I mean the key I think the key to to, to good work in the theatre one of the keys anyway where you should start and, and work really hard to get the right people is casting you know absolutely it's make or break um, and with young actors a lot of the time they haven't developed uh, transformative techniques so that 
Um, they can't change the energy that they have as people in order to become a different character. You know, some, sometimes they can, but generally they're, they're in a more truthful and more interesting and more authentic, emotionally authentic place if there's not, a, there's not a lot of stuff in between them themselves and the characters. So there's, I don't mean that they have to have the same experience, but the energy that you want to represent should be pretty close to the energy that that uh, actor has got. Otherwise, you get into that slightly desperate territory of, you know those um, kids with the pushy mothers that get pushed on stage and they've got all the tricks and the sort of jazz hands and they're very, uh, they're very interested in what sort of impression they're making on a large audience. You get into that sort of acting which can be a bit desperate rather than um, the sort of thing that I'm after in, in, in this production. I, I don't know whether we've achieved it or not, but that sense that you're eavesdropping and that you're witnessing, you're a fly on the wall and actually this is real life going on. The, the, the less you can impose on that, usually the better. Thank you. They do that. Um, I'm just thinking about the, the end. The end. I haven't seen the play and I don't spoil it for anyone. Okay. But, but um, I have seen the film. Oh, and yeah. I've seen the Alan Bennett uh, play, An Englishman Abroad, right. which is about obviously Guy Burgess in, in Russia. And both of those, at the end of his life, as I, I suppose, when he's in Russia, it doesn't seem to be much of a reward for spying, you know, it's that Russia is pictured as very gloomy, yeah. very dour, he's in this little flat, he's <clears> leading a very sort of almost poverty stricken lifestyle. Yeah. And I wondered if, if that, if, is there a sense of that in the play, is there sort of a moral, if you like, almost a punishment for spying, or I don't know how, how your play ends, and I don't want to spoil it for Yeah, you well, um, <laughs> just look out for Matron, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, the, the, that's, that, that was imposed in the film, the kind of book ending of the, 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 the reminiscence. Guy Bennett looking back in time. So that's not in the play at all. So I never really had to uh, address that or think about that. I think um, if you... Anything that I say will spoil it for people that haven't seen it before. Um, I think what's, what's wonderful about theatre, though, just to broaden it out to answer your question, what's wonderful about theatre is that at its best it doesn't do the thinking for the audience. Uh, and sometimes film can be guilty of spelling it all out. Um, and I think you could, you could watch, I, I, I would hope that you could watch this evening's production and you could, you could muse on all sorts of possible outcomes. Uh, I, and it, I would hope that it wasn't so, um, exactly, it, it didn't quite force the sort of audience's thinking. But it's, it's there and we know that. I mean, I suppose that's one of the, one of the interesting things about the end of the, the Soviet bloc is that we know that um, some of the characters' ambitions are, are now in a very particular historical context, aren't they? Mm. But of course, when it was first out in 1981, it was just this monolithic enemy. Yeah, as it, it wasn't as going it anywhere. Were. It wasn't was going it? anywhere. Yeah. So it was, it, you know, that all hadn't even happened, yeah. which is really extraordinary. Um, the thing, I suppose, to finish that that I thought was so wonderful about watching what you've done and, and the cast was to see actually how many things had changed yeah. in a way. That it didn't feel, you know, it was written in the 80s about the 30s. All the debates, as you said right at the beginning, are the same debates. What is the right thing to do? How uh, do we bring up children to make them happy and good people yeah. as opposed to bitter and vengeful who are going to wreak terror. Yeah. And these things don't change, do they? Yeah. It doesn't matter. And I think you've done that enormously. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet seen it, it is a wonderful way to end the 2013 season here. Um, a, a version of another country that I think will stick in everybody's minds. Um, and can I just ask you, um, in a moment, to thank Jeremy Heron, but I must do a couple of bits of housekeeping, which is that the afterwards for this play will be on the 7th of October. You don't have to have gone in for that performance, but if you want to come along, you just need to get a ticket and come in afterwards. And tonight there will be the afterwards post-performance up the park for Neville's Island, and that will be at about 20, about 10 to 10, I think, 9.50.
Again, you don't have to have gone in, but you do have to get a ticket to, to go in to hear that cast talk if you want to do that. If you want to see the, the way that not very successful boys end up, you can see them marooned <laughs> exactly. um, in the yeah, Lake District. Try and, well, if you're park. watching in other countries, try and spot the four that are going to yeah, end, end, up, <laughs> end up on an island in the middle of the Absolutely. Lake Windermere. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the end of a wonderful series, a fantastic season, and I don't think the theatre could go out with a better production than this one. So, could you all join me in thanking Jeremy Heron. <laughs>